Hey everyone, welcome back to Lady Empire. I am so excited for the guest that I have with me here today. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you and um, hear some of your thoughts on some of these topics just as much as mine. So I want to start with you telling us a little bit about your background, um, your situation growing up, and if this sort of affected your career path at all. Yeah, so my background, so I'm an education attorney, and I've been an education attorney for about 20 years, and I specialize in, and we actually can't say specialize in, in some of the states I'm in, so I focus my practice in special needs and children who have special education issues. Uh, my background growing up, I, you know, this hadn't originally been my career path. I wanted to focus on healthcare law um, and helping children within that system, basically setting up programs for them. Um, for instance, children who are hospitalized or getting chemotherapy and doing some of that actually by working for a hospital. Um, so it was a little bit different when I actually got into representing parents against school districts. Um, and that path actually very much came about because of the internship I, internships I was doing in law school. Wow, that's awesome. So what was your educational background then? Where did you go to school and uh, where did you go to law school? So I went to law school at Indiana, uh, Indiana University, and that's in Indianapolis. And um, I graduated from there in 2000. And um, back then I worked um, as an outside general counsel um, in, in a law firm for um, a couple different hospitals. And that my real focus was trying to do uh, work as a patient liaison when we had legal issues cropping up. And that's where we started to get more and more cases involving children who we couldn't get services from their school system. And I realized we had a really big problem and it was a very surprising problem to me. So as you were growing up and before you committed to law school, um, you know, did you have this idea in your head that you really wanted to be a lawyer or where did you sort of um, fall into that commitment? You know, interestingly, um, I always wanted to be a lawyer, mostly because I really liked fighting for the underdog. And I, you know, my, my family is all in the medical profession. And um, my thought was, back when I was young, it was just interesting to see, for instance, people who couldn't pay for medical care or we were in Texas and we, there were a lot of illegal immigrants and it was very hard for them to access medical care. It was hard for them um, to really navigate the system. And I knew that lawyers could help on some of those issues and you really need people out there you know, campaigning um, for people who are truly in need of assistance. Um, and so I always was interested in that and um, really wanted to dedicate my life to something I knew would help others. And sort of, and children are, you know, when we look at, at kids and the elderly, these are two groups that are really underrepresented by attorneys nationwide. Um, it's why you don't see a lot of nursing home cases. You don't see a lot of advocacy for the elderly. Um, and the same is true for children. And most people don't realize that. Um, there are really very few attorneys nationwide who represent children with special needs against school systems to get them appropriate programming, home homebound programs, if they're, for instance, they have cancer and they're getting chemotherapy. Um, it's, it's really surprising when you get into it to see the lack of advocacy and to also see how the system, even with schools, is far more bureaucratic than I think that most people imagine it is. Yeah, that's so interesting. I never thought about how underrepresented, you know, the groups of elderly and children are. Um, and that kind of leads into my next point about um, the pandemic education and what's been going on with, you know, students learning at home and the parents having to take on that role of now being teachers and, and incorporating that. So what are some of the major challenges that you've seen occur during this whole pandemic regarding children's education? You know, I've seen um, a lot of challenges. I've also seen a lot of good things happen. Um, and I'll start off with the good things and then I'll, I'll move on to those challenges. The good things are, I think we're seeing children who were really stressed in a school environment do very, very well online. 
Um, I think it's also showing parents that there are additional options if they have a child who has, for instance, um, a lot of sensory issues and they want to shorten school day, but they also want that child to be getting, you know, reading instruction. Um, and also, I think for children who are in high school who want to move a little bit more quickly in some of their classes, it does open the door for actually giving them access to online curriculum so they can move at a faster pace um, and hopefully graduate early. The challenges I'm seeing um, really vary from school district to school district. I saw some school districts really step up um, by providing parents um, with online access. They would basically cover internet bills. They got um, local um, companies like Comcast to basically ensure that every family had Wi-Fi. They reimbursed that. Um, they made sure every child had a computer. If a child could not access that system, they were providing handout documents. There were teachers who were actually coming, um, working through windows with students. So you would see some school districts doing that. Other school districts, the law basically said that if you're providing any instruction for general education students, you have to provide it for special education students as well. Some school districts just decided to shut down entirely versus provide services for special education students. And that was really, in, in my mind, something that we never should have seen. Um, you know, eliminating reading instruction for a child with dyslexia or behavioral instruction for a child with autism really has an extraordinarily detrimental effect. And um, a lot of school districts were doing this just to get out of some of these obligations. And then, you know, the I think one of the biggest problems I saw was school districts just who um, sort of exhibited a lack of caring. And that's certainly not all of them. There are some that I would say have been phenomenal. But that lack of caring um, was, you know, parents would be sending emails pleading for assistance, um, and they just weren't getting responses at all from their school district. And you know, since this started last March, and there are still some school districts that are online, I mean, we're talking about a really long time period. So in some districts, we're talking about a year with very little instruction for students. I want to highlight the point that you mentioned, um, there hasn't been much care, um, certainly not in all school districts, but in some districts around, um, you know, kids with special needs and what they're going to do during this pandemic. And another topic I kind of want to bring up is, you know, what are these parents expected to do? Obviously, you know, a lot of parents are working full time and their kids are at school during the day. And now they are taking on that role of having to care for their children and, and teach their children and be in a role that they're not really privy to. So how do you think that these parents are coping with transitioning this role and and you know maybe taking time away from their daily job and to now help students especially their kids with special needs you know how are they coping and how are they doing during this time some parents are coping really well but those are mostly in situations where you have one parent who can be a stay-at-home parent um, and you don't need a dual income household. The, the families that are really struggling were the dual income households where you all of a sudden have a situation and where you have both parents are essential workers. So it's not, they can't work on computer, they really had to go in. Um, those families have been really deeply impacted, unfortunately. And um, also single parent households, we're seeing parents who really just don't have um, sometimes the skills either uh, to be teaching their child. And when we see a parent who has a child home for seven months and they're not educated, let's say on a, a reading modality, Linda Mood Bell or Orton Gillingham, now trying to work with their child because the school is just sending home grade level materials or saying you can come to the online Zoom classes, it really does pose a big problem. And you touched a little bit on the education system side of things. So I wanna ask, do you think that the educational system provided all the necessary resources needed for both parents and students during this time? I would say in general, absolutely not. Um, and that's because it's the fact is that many school districts should be aware there can be natural disasters 
there can be things that happen where the school building is destroyed. The fact that schools had so little in the way of any type of contingency plans um, was concerning, um, especially when we look at charter schools that are online, right? They've found ways to offer these things, these, this type of curriculum. And you know, what I saw from schools was really, you know, and we're talking even a year later, right? I mean, the first month or two, right? We were all in chaos, right? And, and we, I think we have to see all that with grace. Um, but I see school districts still a year later who cannot figure out how to do online counseling with a student who needs it, um, cannot figure out, you know, what a, what, what the child's instructional level is, and they're not doing evaluations or taking any other steps. And part of that is there's so little enforcement of the laws that require these things for schools. And um, the federal law is called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that is the law that requires schools to provide appropriate programs that are accessible um, to students with special needs. And that includes whether they have cognitive needs, behavioral needs, functional needs, right? I mean, it runs the whole gamut from a child who has ADHD to a child who's really quite impaired. Um, and, you know, what, we're, what we tend to be seeing is school districts that, um, because there's so little enforcement, they're cutting lots and lots of corners, and they're just waiting to see if a parent um, tries to bring an, an, what, what we would call an administrative action against them because so few parents actually do. So what are the repercussions then for these school systems that aren't providing these resources? And if a parent does decide to act on this, what happens to the school system? So that's the problem. So the only repercussion a school is going to have is to fix the issue now. And they may get ordered to provide what's called compensatory educational services and that type of thing, which is basically they have to make up some of the hours they miss, but it's not an hour per hour um, determination. It's based on the student's needs. That's their worst case scenario. There's not educational negligence. There's no damages. So if I'm a school system and I fail to provide a reading program for 300 kids and five of those parents bring what's called an educational due process case against me. I now have to provide that reading program and maybe I have to provide some hours to make up for the reading program I didn't provide. Um, I may have to pay their attorney's fees because there's a fee shifting statute. But you know, this isn't tobacco litigation. So attorney's fees aren't really that bad. So schools are actually at sort of a disincentive to follow the laws. Because if I'm a school district and I'm looking at this from you know, a purely financial standpoint, do I wanna pay you know, reading specialists to do all these online programs or pay for you know, additional private people to come on and, and teach in an online program? Or do I just wanna wait and see if, if parents bring actions? Um, in some school districts, no parents won't bring actions at all. They don't know their rights. They're scared of, um, retaliation from their school district, you know, they're afraid that they can't afford an attorney, although many attorneys do this on sliding scales because you can, you know, seek your attorney's fees back. But that's what happens. Um, in, in almost any state in the United States, you're looking at less than 1% of parents who ever challenge their child's education. We're talking about really, really low numbers. And if you think of like all the students who are not receiving services, not getting the reading programs they need, not having their specific learning disability, um, either diagnosed or you know, accommodated. I mean, we're talking about massive numbers but we're talking about less than 1%. And in most states, it's literally, you know, 1% of 1% that even ever brings an action. That's horrible. And, you know, I want to get your point of view as an attorney. What do you think needs to change? How can we improve the educational system in regard to this issue? What do you think needs to be brought to action to make this a better process for parents and students? I think the first thing is accountability for schools. Um, and I don't know if we change the laws to make the enforcement a little bit stricter. Maybe we have the 
department, you know, the state departments of education actually sending out information to parents on their rights, helping educate them, um, making the system easier for parents to even navigate on their own without attorneys, um, so that this becomes a process, some sort of like a, a social security disability claim. You could do it on your own if you chose, you could get an attorney. Um, this should not be a complex process for a parent. It really shouldn't be. And I think the second thing is that we actually, I think that we need to make sure that parents are truly aware of their rights. Um, most parents have very little understanding that they can challenge their school system and that they can do so and the costs are actually for that challenging are gonna be picked up by their State Department of Education. Um, most parents who have children who have residential needs, like they have a schizoaffective disorder or a mood disorder or depression with psychosis, for instance, are unaware that their school district may have to pay for the residential placement that their child is being placed in. And so when we start to put all of these things together, um, it really you can see that parents and you know even you and I, if we weren't in this field and, and, and until I was in it, I had no idea. Like it wasn't until I was working at a hospital and we were trying to, a, a health insurance company um, was refusing to pay for a residential. And I actually got out the education laws and was going through them and realized that the school district, so back in the 70s, when they got rid of a lot of institutions and then they changed the law in the 80s, school districts got increasing funding and the departments of education got funding to place students in the residentials. So once I learned that, we were able to get funding for that child through the school system. And it was just so eye-opening to me. And you brought up a great point how I think a lot of parents and families are really just uneducated about, you know, what they can do for themselves and for their families. I mean, I think when you mention the word law and you mention the word attorney, people run the opposite way, right? And so I think that's so interesting is they do have the opportunity at not a huge cost to, you know, get what they deserve. And, you know, I think that's so important that, you know, parents really need to be educated on what they're able to do and what resources they have. And they do, they have a lot. Um, so parents have the ability to request an evaluation of their child. There's something called child fine. Schools are supposed to basically let parents know that if their child has any disability, um, that they can do an evaluation of that child for the disability. But they actually, it goes a step further. And that is um, a situation where if any time a child, you know, they know that a child may have a disability. I'll give you an example. A child who's failing their standardized testing or a child that they get a diagnosis from a physician saying they have Asperger's. Um, any child, believe it or not, even if they're homeless, the school districts have an affirmative duty to go out and seek these children and say, we're gonna make testing available. Um, we can make psychiatric services available. We can make um, uh, psychology services available and we can make academic testing available. Um, and for the most part, as you might imagine, most school districts don't do this. And when we take that a step further, once these programs are in place, schools have the duty to create not only appropriate plans, but plans that are ambitious and challenging. Um, and again, you know, I look at what are called IEPs. Those are individualized education um, plans every day. And I will see one for a child with a, um, what we would call borderline IQ, which means they're gonna have some substantial issues, specific learning disabilities, their reading level maybe seven years below their peers, and I will see one goal and no services. And so I look at documents all the time that even someone who's not experienced in this area would see and say, this is shocking. This, is, I mean, I think if most of the American public saw what I saw, they think it was shocking. The other thing I think they would think is shocking, people have a idea that if all of a sudden we started providing all these services, it would be really expensive. And that's not the case. What most parents are asking for is what we would expect out of a school system, right? You would expect that they would have reading specialists on staff, um, that they would put in place, you know, a licensed clinical social workers for counseling. These are not that 
pricey of items. Um, and instead, what we'll see is we'll see schools spend upward of, you know, between 100000 and there are cases out there of a million dollars to fight providing a reading program for a child or to fight making them eligible for special education because they want to make a point that parents shouldn't challenge the system. And I am sure the taxpayers of some of these districts would not want, you know, a child not to be eligible for special education and for a million dollars of taxpayer dollars to go there. Um, and they do a lot of it through hiding those funds through their insurance companies so that most of the school board just sees their insurance premiums going up. They don't actually see where that money's going. This is so interesting. And I love that you sort of have a um, backside view of this because I think a lot of us who are listening and tuning in don't know this and we don't have any education on this and we don't know what's truly going on behind the scenes. And so it's so interesting to hear your view on this. And I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, education during the pandemic. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what has gone on in schools before the pandemic, specifically on the topic of bullying. Um, I've read you've done a few cases with um, you know, sexual abuse and bullying and things like this within schools. So how prevalent was bullying um, before COVID? Um, and how do you think the internet has sort of enhanced this? So bullying is really prevalent. Um, and it's, bullying is more prevalent in schools than would ever be in any workplace. And it's actually far more prevalent now than I think it was even in the 70s and 80s because of social media. Um, and you have to remember too, more, there are more children in one parent households or where both, kid, or bo or both parents work. So children are left more unattended than they've ever been, right? And so we have sort of all of these factors working together to create a situation where kids are really um, at each other's throats in some respects. Um, the problem that I see is also the stress level of kids. I'm, you know, from when I started 20 years ago, and that's not that long ago, right? If we look at, at how long that people tend to practice. Um, but when I started 20 years ago, I thought kids were stressed out and now they are really at their wits end. Um, I get high school students in all the time who have four or five hours of homework. You know, they also have, you know, bullying issues going on. Um, you know, most of us don't want to leave our jobs at three o'clock in the afternoon and still have five hours worth of work to do. Um, it's, it's really unreasonable. And, you know, what's shocking to me as well is that if we actually look at where we're headed um, education wise as a nation compared to other first world nations, we actually have more stressed out kids, more homework um, than any other nation, and yet our scores are going down. And a lot of that is just a real lack of a logical approach. Um, and I know that's slightly off from the bullying, but I mean, as a whole, I can tell you it's a really, really big problem um, because we're burning out our young people before they even hit college. Um, we're seeing, you know, I, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of the issues that we are. We're seeing a lot less innovation as a country because creative thinking is no longer being encouraged. Um, you know, it's, I, you can tell I have at this point, you know, I had, before I got into this, I had this sort of, I had always had great experiences in school and I had a Pollyanna-ish view as I think many parents do of the school systems, right? I, I mean, I had great teachers. I remember my third grade teacher, Miss Patterson. I loved it. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed high school compared to a lot of people out there. I mean, I actually had, you know, I'm still very good friends with my high school best friend. I can, this was, you know, quite a while ago now. Um, but what, what we see now are students that are really um, just, they are pushed to the brink really early on in life. We're not, um, we're not educating students in any sort of way that makes sense, right? You can be in 10th grade and be performing at a freshman and college level, and we're going to keep you in 10th grade. You can be in 10th grade performing at a sixth grade level, and we're going to just try and accommodate you in 10th grade, but we may not give you things that are your instructional level. When you combine all of these things, these kids not only are stressed out, what happens when we're stressed? It's natural, right? You've watched like you're having a bad day and you have a sibling or a spouse, right? You tend to, you know, it's like it's lighter being thrown on a fire. 
So you have kids that are stressed out. They're scared they're not going to get the right SAT scores. They're not going to get the right you know, grades. You know, somebody's posting about them on Instagram. It's a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, when I, I have handled um, some school shooting cases as well, and about two years ago, I was doing a show, and it was, I think it was 2018. It was the year that we had a school shooting every single week. And, you know, we keep asking, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And it's because we really have a tender box in, in, in respect to the stress level of students. Um, and we're not addressing mental health needs. We're not coming up with how do we logically protect students, right? And, you know, on that note, we seem to have a good amount of protection now at airports, museums, right? School shootings are totally foreseeable now, totally foreseeable. Um, and I will tell you, I fight almost every day to get children who have severe mental health issues eligible for special education and any sort of counseling in the school system. Schools fight me tooth and nail at identifying children who could be risks to them. Um, and they spend a ton of taxpayer dollars to do so. So I, there is no love lost when I see these types of things and I try and, you know, do things to sort of prompt them. And it's, it's just, it's a really unfortunate situation. That's so crazy. I mean, yeah. it's so much to even wrap your head around, but I definitely agree that school shootings are foreseeable and because of just the stress level that these kids are being put under. And I also wanted to mention, I mean, that's what triggered the whole um, uh, college scandal of, you know, parents hiring people to take their students' SATs and ACTs because their kids are so stressed and under so much pressure to even complete these tests at the best level that they can that, you know, it just leads to such, it just goes down such a dark, dark hole. And it's so unfortunate. And, you know, the next question I wanted to ask is, what do you see that these schools have in place? What preventative programs do they have in place for stress, mental health, burnout, bullying, any of those horrible topics? How are schools helping students with these issues? I can tell you the majority of them, while they may send some newsletter to parents saying they have some sort of program, the majority of them, and I work in three states and then all over the country, you know, with other attorneys, have nothing. And when parents go to these schools for help, they are discouraged from seeking help. They are referred or they're referred to outside resources. You know, I, I was looking at something actually today. Um, where a parent went to a school for help and they referred them to outside counseling and said, you know, you can get your child evaluated here. If they need counseling, you can go here. They made no offer to the parent about what the school could do for that child. Um, and so, and, and that's absolutely contrary to the law. Um, and so I think that's, that's what we see in a lot of places. Um, so, that, you know, there's this idea that schools have these anti-bullying programs that are like be kind and those types of things and some schools i have seen schools do a good job of it but the vast majority don't and you know i have i i have a number of clients right now who have had just horrible bullying situations um you know one of the worst things you see too is when you get the suicide cases where a child has been bullied relentlessly um, and in some of those cases, you can see where a parent has emailed the school for years pleading for help. And you have to, and, and we see what happens is when a parent can't afford a private school, okay? You have a, usually we see this in situations where you have both parents um, who are working and they can't afford a private school or we see a single parent. And we have compulsory attendance laws in this country, right? People always say, well, why didn't they just pull them out? Because most of these parents cannot homeschool their child. And by law, they are forced to then send them to a public school. And I, you know, I feel like if I go into my workplace and somebody grabs a trash can and like flings it over my head, somebody pushes me into the wall, I have an assault and battery case, right? If somebody calls me a really horrible name as I walk down the hall, that person is going to be fired or there are going to be consequences. If I go into a school as a high school student, middle schooler, I can have all this happen every day and I have no choice but to go back the next day. And um, very few schools take action. 
Um, and then the unfortunate thing is sometimes when they take action, it's situations that don't fit the bill at all. Like um, I had a, a case where they expelled um, a student who um, under Title IX saying that he had sexually harassed another student. My client had Down syndrome and a 40 IQ and was nonverbal and he had tickled a classmate. I mean, th these types of things, you know, when we see an expulsion for that, I'm like, this is, this is getting ridiculous. Um, they're not providing counseling services either for the kids who are bullies, right? And there's some reason that they're bullying um, are the ones who are being bullied. And again, any workforce in America, this wouldn't be tolerated at all. And so, I mean, it wouldn't even be tolerated at your local mall. Um, I cannot figure out for the life of me why it's tolerated at school. And I'm also a believer um, in the, you know, kids are going to be kids. There are things that are like traditional, like fourth grade little spats, right? I'm not saying that we certainly, you know, go after every child, but schools should have programs in place, both for kids who are bullies and kids who are being bullied to teach appropriate social skills. Um, and I don't necessarily either think that students who are bullies should be expelled, but perhaps they, you know, we have alternative schools, we have other places they can go to within the school where they can be getting intense counseling, we can look into their home environment, we can provide them additional services. Um, I certainly don't think sending them home <laughs> is the way to necessarily deal with it. Um, but the fact that we don't do these things and we have so many problems is, is a concern. So we talked a little bit about the school's role in all of this, and I want to touch a little bit on the parent's role. Um, you know, if you're the parent of the bully or if you're the parent of the student being bullied, what's your role in all of this? What action should you be taking? So if you are the parent of a bully, um, we, I mean, that is difficult. Um, but it usually comes in a couple of different ways. Sometimes kids will develop bullying behavior because they have, for instance, um, you know, a specific learning disability or they have something going on that they're trying to compensate for, right? So they're trying to get attention. They're trying to sort of puff up because they feel vulnerable within a school environment. Other bullies are kids who may have a history of abuse. Maybe they were adopted, they're in foster care. And then you get the third category, which is just are kids trying to figure out how to socialize appropriately. And they found that this gets them friends, right? I mean, so you can have your third group, which is just probably at least 50 to 60% of them. If you're the parent there, you know, I, I think listening with a, sort of an open heart and mind if the school contacts you and then asking the school for assistance from a licensed clinical social worker there. And that's not because they're going to report the child to Department of Child Services. It's just because counseling is shown to be very helpful for that. Um, schools are supposed to have at least um, licensed clinical social workers, which are basically therapists on staff. Um, the school psychologist can intervene. You may want to get the child some type of testing. And certainly you don't have to. I mean, there are plenty of A students who this is just them navigating, right? And then there's the natural, you know, what we see in middle school, the natural, what we would call sort of just teasing, taunting, to me, at least, that doesn't rise to the level of some of the bullying cases I see, which are just relentless um, torture of another human being um, on a daily basis. And that to me is very different. I see a lot of middle school cases and I'm just like, yeah, I mean, middle school's hard. Um, if you're the parent of a child getting bullied, you need to create the best paper trail you can. And what I think that parents of children who are getting bullied need to be aware of is that there are options. Um, and I think if your school is not listening to you, going and seeing if there is a voucher program in your community, um, if there are charter schools. Some people are anti-charter school. I have seen parents get their children out of horrific bullying situations because they finally have school choice. Um, so originally, I wasn't sure I felt about charter schools. Now I really believe we need to have options. Um, and so I think all of those alternatives, but I, I think my message to them would be, if it's a situation where you believe your child's mental health is so impacted that it may be irreparable, try and get them out of that situation. Um, because I've seen too, way too many schools wait too long um, to address those, those issues. So we talked a little bit on mental health and how important that is. 
Um, so how do you think parents and students can maintain their mental health, especially during this time um, with the pandemic and everything? What should they incorporate into their daily lives to just stay up on their mental health and, um, you know, feel good? Yeah. So I think for parents, it's knowing that this situation isn't forever and that you are going to have options, right? And, and if the situation gets bad enough, you're going to have the option to talk to an attorney. You're going to have the option to sit down with your school and say, here's what my child needs now to catch up. And then as far as mental health, just again, um, knowing that things are time limited really is a help. And that um, with kids, you can miss a little bit of time and catch right up. I mean, it's I think knowing that um, there are going to be some remedies for any sort of issue. I know I've said that a couple of times, but that I, I, it's because I've been saying it all day to concerned parents. Um, but I think that that is the thing they need to remember. And I think the same is true for teachers. So when I talk about schools too, I, am, I, you know, I want to make something really clear. Most people who go into teaching do so with the very best intentions, but what they find is a bureaucracy that's not organized, right? They, they get very little training on what they're supposed to do. Most teachers have no clue which students in their class have IEPs. They don't understand all of the disabilities. They, they haven't been trained to work with all these different disabilities. And they feel at this time like they wanna pull their hair out, right? Because they're trapped in the same system that the parents are. I, you know, who I really fault here are the administrators and how we are basically structuring school, which goes up almost on a, on a federal level at this point, but certainly on a statewide level. Um, but for kids, I think really keeping them involved with as many things outside of academics is great. And that does not mean sports. Um, that means if they're interested in theater, right? If they're interested in playing cards, if they're interested in games, there are a ton of online club, clubs right now. Um, some school districts I've seen actually have these clubs like every afternoon online. They have teachers in there doing Zoom. They're watching movies. They're playing games. I love those school districts, right? Because they are saying, you know, we know that these kids need outlets. We know that they need like the Zoom group. We know that they need the Zoom pizza party on Friday night that they can come to. So, you know, that's, you know, I do. I see some school districts, and you know, and I want to reflect on this too, is I see some school districts that go so above and beyond that you look at them and you say, I wish we could just, you know, put this school district on the national news and teach the others how to do it. Um, but I, I think that that's where keeping kids focused, that there's a whole world outside of simply the academics of school um, that is open and, and wonderful. And um, that as far as, you know, wearing masks and all of these things, it may, I mean, it may last for a while, but life eventually, you know, it goes back to normal, sort of like how you can have the cleanest room in the world and then give it a week, right? I mean, they're their clothes will be back on the floor. So, I agree with the point that it's so important to have these kids in after school activities, whether that's sports, um, music, um, like you mentioned, cards, movies, games, whatever it is, whatever your kid is interested in, put them in it, get them involved, get them social. Um, and I think that that's, you know, what stems bullying and what stems suicide and school shootings is, you know, these kids don't have an outlet. They don't have a social outlet. They don't have something that they can commit to and be present for. And so I think that's just so important that parents need to realize is that kids need things other than school and their parents. So I think that's such a great point that you make on that. And so I just want to ask my final question is, um, as an attorney, what is the one major thing that you hope to accomplish in your role, helping students, helping families? What do you really want to accomplish? I think the best thing I could ac accomplish would be to empower parents to ask for change, um, to ask for the reading programs their district needs, the math programs, the um, board certified behavior analysts to do ABA therapy for the kiddos with autism. Um, programs that these school districts need to really serve 
all of the all of their students. And so if parents actually all start to step up, start to realize that they have you know, these rights, I, I do see school districts respond. Um, you know, they, they ask for more funds, they shift around things. And I see those school districts start to provide these services. And then they can serve all of their students, not simply the ones who are at the top of the class. And so I think that that will be sort of a chain reaction. If I can give parents knowledge, um, then my hope will be they're going to give the IEP team knowledge. They're going to ask for these things. They're going to insist upon them. And then once they get them, other families will be able to have access to them as well. And so to close it out, I'm going to ask... Um, a fun fact about you, which I do with all of my guests, and to lighten up our interview, we had such great conversation and such great topics. Thank you for all of your information. Um, so for a fun fact about you, and you are so beautiful, so you have to tell us, what is your favorite beauty product that you use right now? Oh, that, okay. So that's a funny question. Um, it is Pillow Talk Lipstick. Um, by who is that? Charlotte Tillsbury. Charlotte Tillsbury. Pillow talk lipstick. You know, another fun fact is as a hobby, I horseback ride and I do endurance horse riding, or I used to, um, of Arabians over really long distances. So on top of my lipstick. <laughs> Lipstick and horseback riding. I yeah. love that. See, I try to get things out of academics too, right? I want to be outside of the school environment in my off time. Yes, that's a great hobby that you have, and I'm glad that you do that. That's amazing. Well, awesome. Yeah, so where can we find you on social media? How do we connect with you and see what you're doing and see what you're speaking on? Yeah, you can um, visit our main firm website. It's um, www.cmklawfirm.com. My firm is Connell Michael Kerr. Um, our headquarters office is in Indiana, but we have um, practices in Michigan, uh, Texas. Um, we have attorneys who practice in Alaska and Pennsylvania. So we have, we have a, a, our little uh, offices in a variety of places. Um, you they can also find me on Facebook. It's Catherine Michael, education attorney. Um, and I will often have, I have a lot of posts. There are um, Facebook lives I do. Um, if I'm going out and doing a seminar, um, I'm there. If you email me directly, and my email is Catherine, that's C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E -E at cmklawfirm.com. I have coffee groups with parents um, once to twice a week where we go over various topics and they can feel free to ask questions and not worry about, oh my goodness, how much is an attorney going to cost? All I want to know is how to get my child an IEP or how do I request an independent evaluation? So I try and have parents who want to participate in some of those. I try to make them feel welcome and say, here's when we're doing it. That's so wonderful that you do that. And I really encourage parents um, to reach out to Catherine. She is such a great resource. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much again. We had some amazing conversations and I really appreciate all the information you offered to us. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much as well. I really enjoyed it.